Frank, good morning to you. And Robert Smith, thank you so much for being here. Good to see you, Leslie. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> Very excited for this conversation. I want to start on AI because it's clearly transforming everything about software. And given what you've seen so far, do you see this as essentially a, a technology that's creating a, a productivity revolution or some sort of valuation bubble? So it is, again, a new general purpose technology that has massive implications across the entire global economy. And I'm not understating the implications of, of that. Uh, what we are saying, of course, in the way we operate, we operate in 180 countries, over 70 different industries, is we have built now a, a factory to convert, call it enterprise software companies, to become agented, which is quite new, quite novel. It's very similar to what we did in going from on-prem to cloud and building a factory in that construct. And as far as I know, we've done more of those than anyone else. Now we're, we're now at the state where we, we're now able to convert them from these cloud-based companies to agented. The implications are massive in the productivity. So our average software company delivers about a 625% ROI to the companies that they, that they serve and their customers. This actually is exponential to that in terms of what it can deliver. Multiples in some cases exponential. So we're seeing massive opportunity in that, in that construct. Enterprise software I think will end up in three states. One state is what I call agentist, and our factory will convert those. Another state, what was the rule of 40, now becomes the rule of 70. 70 is the new 40. You can use this, this new technology to improve the efficiency of product development, go-to-market, customer support, all of the aspects to run a company so they become more profitable, more efficient, and can grow faster. So those are two elements. And the third state is if you haven't prepared these businesses well, you may not have a right to exist in the future. So that's the nature of how enterprise software is being affected by artificial intelligence. So what does that mean for someone's day-to-day -day life? If, if you don't have an agent now, will you have one pretty soon? If you don't have one pretty soon, will you be out of a job? I mean, how, how do you see this changing the workforce? So at, at a high level, there are about one billion knowledge workers on the planet. And these knowledge workers have done a, a very effective job, frankly, in, in raising the, the, the standard of living across the planet. Well, those knowledge workers now are consuming, I'll call it, or producing about $40 trillion in, you know, in spend and economic opportunity in terms of their salaries and bonuses, all that sort of a thing. Every one of those knowledge workers' businesses will now be impacted by Gen AI. You know, for one of our companies that, that Satya announced on, on his, his build conference, Gainsight, which is the first one we got out of our factory, actually the implications of going from one user to 12 agents doing the work of, you know, 12, 15 people and even more in that context, you can see the productivity dynamics. You know, a user, a, a customer service agent who may have three or 400 customers that they have to manage, maybe gets to five or eight of them a day, we can get to all of them every day, okay? So you can see that, that the productivity and implications of that on, on the knowledge worker environment. So if you aren't utilizing agents today, your job will very much become at risk. Uh, and if you are utilizing them, you have a potential to actually create a massive amount of value as an, an orchestrator of how those agents do the work and the tasks that you work on every single day. So massive implications in terms of how it changes the work environment and the workforce uh, globally. Colin here back at CNBC HQ. Great to see you as always. Oh, Leslie, thank you very much. Hey, Robert. Frank Holland here at CNBC HQ. Great to see you as always. Um, we're talking a lot about agentic AI, and you've said before it's important to be fast, and you also have to be first. You said it's not really a rising tide with a lot of winners. It's about being fast and first. Are you looking in the quantum space as well? And where do you see the opportunities? And here in the U.S., are we fast? Are we first? Where do you see that race going? It's a great question, Frank, uh, and I, I do believe you have to get there fast first, and so which is one of the reasons we're building our systems at scale so we can convert them in a factory-like environment as opposed to individual instances of success in, in portfolio companies. So even our smallest companies have access to this, to, this, to this platform. They have access to our relationships with Anthropic and OpenAI and Microsoft and Google, etc. All of those important parts of building out the ability to get all of the companies fast first, and then from an underwriting perspective, how do we find companies that we can transform the rule of 70 or an agentic uh, in, in business going forward, which we think will create a massive advantage for Vista. When you think about quantum, I think one of the areas where it's going to, to, to really impact our world, which is how we're embracing it today, is when you create agents, one user now goes to multiple agents, 10, 12, 15 agents. You've now increased the surface area of attack. 
If you think about it, as a user, we have to protect you from cyber attack. With agents, you now, you know, you actually have a multiplicity of, of, of surface area of attack vectors. So quantum encryption, I think, will become, which is one of the things we're working on with our portfolio companies with some very specific partners, a very unique way in which we can protect our agents. In some cases, it's going to be in an environment in a virtual machine. In other cases, it's going to be protecting specific and individual agents in the environments in which they operate. Those are the two phases that we're already working on today with, with very specific partners on how to use quantum encryption as a protecting agent uh, for our agents. Uh, Robert, That's a also, question, in the last couple of years, Robert, you've taken about six companies private, and you've alluded to the fact that valuations are a bit elevated, and if they weren't so elevated, maybe you'd take more companies private. I want to talk about the healthcare space. At least in the public markets, that's not true. Eleva uh, 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 valuations have been a bit discounted. Are you looking in the healthcare space? Do you see opportunities for enterprise software in that space right now? We, we are constantly looking for opportunities. And I think you know this, Frank, as we saw the, the valuations increase in that bubble in 2021, and I call it the tech wreck that happened uh, after 2021. That's when we've done the, you know, again, six take privates in that period of time at valuations that were equal to one of our best returning funds in 2017, 2018. So we're excited about that. And then creating an agentic solution set for many of those businesses and being able to operate them at rule of 70, rule of 80 with agentic products that they can sell to the, to, into the, to the, the their environment creates a massive return opportunity for the funds that we're investing with right now. Now, in, across every single sector, of course, within healthcare, you have to think about a different regulatory environment dynamic. All that said, we have a company today, and I was on the call last week with our CEO and, and uh, the product development team, and how we are identifying that entire business. So a massive opportunity that will actually should create a TAM expansion of 3X of what that company had existing. So again, as we have built this factory and have the agentive solution sets, which you've actually got to create a set of, I'll call it administrative agents that manage the working agents in a way in, in highly regulated environments. So you don't actually create risk by introducing agents to those environments. As we, I'll call it, perfect those, it creates a massive opportunity for, for us to look more at enterprise software companies that are in the healthcare space specifically. So it sounds like, just to kind of uh, recap your thoughts here, a year ago, there was this notion that AI spend was going to eat up software spend, and if you were kind of in that software space, more legacy space, that you were going to miss out on the AI revolution, not benefit from it. It sounds like that's dramatically transformed with agentic AI over the last year and, and will continue to do so in the future. I think that's, that's a great insight. What is actually happening is AI can feed enterprise software. But you have to have what I call the sovereignty and dominion of the workloads and the data sets for that to happen. Otherwise, you end up in the state where there, you don't have a right to exist. But if you already are the trusted provider of the workloads, the information, and you're producing the data, unique uh, you know, data in an environment, in some cases it's an industry, in many cases it's the company, you will be the trusted partner. That is your right to win, and you create agents that actually have all of the requirements on compliance and regulatory and you know the administrative pieces of it. A massive opportunity for your customers to benefit from and as the enterprise software vendor to actually benefit from as well. Hey, Robert Frank again. Um, a couple weeks ago, you were on our air. You said you believe that when it comes to trade and the administration, we're going to see a number of bilateral deals coming up. It's been a few weeks, and of course, we're in the middle of two pauses. But what's your view of the trade negotiations right now? Uh, I'm sure you also have insight through your companies. I mean, where do you think we're at when it comes to a China trade deal and also deals with some other countries? Yeah, I can't give you specifics on where we're at, but I know that based on our partnerships, our relationship, because we have, you know, again, we operate in 180 different countries, I'll get calls from certain of our sovereign wealth partners and saying, hey, listen, we're looking to change some, some shape of a deal, and it's going to massively tra change trading dynamics. Of course, Enterprise Software gives you insights into that. One of our companies in our Endeavor Fund actually has the ability to do the modeling around how the supply chains change. So we've seen a massive spike over the last three weeks as these trade negotiations have gone on from some of the more interesting customers saying, okay, how do you model this, change in the tariff, change in the trade agreement in terms of shipping, et cetera. So the interesting thing about Enterprise Software is we kind of get uh, kind of canary in the coal mine insights because we actually see how people are utilizing the tools and the data uh, and the information flows about how they're thinking about modeling and evaluating certain changes. So I'm very optimistic that we, as we end up with these, these, you know, these trade deals getting settled, 
that will actually create a unique opportunity again, not only for us, but for, for you know, the new equilibrium set of trade uh, for people to actually take advantage of. So I'm excited about that. Where we are in the state, you got to go talk to Scott about that, the Secretary <laughs> of Treasury, about where we are in the state, current state. But I'm seeing already activity of people doing some what if and scenario planning using, using some of our, our software tools. Yeah, data clearly still the new gold. Absolutely. Uh, Robert Smith, CEO of Vista, thank you so much for joining us here in Berlin from Super Return. Always a pleasure, Leslie. Thank you. Time. Thank you, Frank.